Peace and blessings, everyone. Wa alaikum salam, Jabril. Good to see you. All right, we're going to invite our guest. Let's see. Hello. Oh, hello, Eddie. Yes. All right. Peace and blessings, everyone. Welcome back to our IG Live, Unveiling Love, Stories of Community and Social Change. I'm Amina. This is a space where we speak with artists and leaders that discuss their defining moments that shape their efforts in creating safety, in creating community and solidarity for all in the community so all can thrive. This podcast is part of a Love Over Fear Oakland campaign invited or organized by our Interfaith Movement for Human um, Integrity family in Oakland. You know, through defending humanity of immigrants and defending the rights of the incarcerated by uniting faith communities, inter, uh, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity works at the intersection of social movements and faith. So this campaign is um, a response to the challenges faced by communities of color in Oakland. They acknowledge the root causes that disrupt safety and community collaborations. So artists like myself were brought on as cultural strategists to nurture connections, reshape the public conversations around um, our relationship between the AAPI, the Black and Chicano family. And when it comes to bridging gaps and fostering connections and racial solidarity. My guest today has been putting in the work for many, many years and has inspired so many people, including my, myself. He spent 20 years of his life in prison for crimes committed at the age of 16 since returning to the free world uh, in 2007. 2007, president and founder of New Breath Foundation, Eddie Zhang, have dedicated his life in serving the youth, raising awareness of the negative impact uh, that the prison industrial complex has on the Asian Pacific Islander population and promotes racial harmony among people of color to work towards a collective vision of true healing and racial justice. Please welcome a great community leader, a friend, my birthday twin, Eddie Zhang. <laughs> welcome, Eddie. Zhou san. Zhou san, Zhou san. Uh, breath to everyone. Yes. So I, I just said, um, good morning. How are you in Cantonese? That's my Cantonese brother, everyone. Um, Eddie, it is an honor to have you. Thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Um, your story is so inspiring, and I want folks to get to know a little bit about it because you had to create, we talk about freedom, you had to create mental freedom before physical freedom and I want you to kind of share with us um, the process when you were in prison at such a young age and your journey of creating this mental freedom and how has that guide your work in the community yeah well uh, you know May is a, a celebration of the Asian American Pacific Islander uh, Native Hawaiian month uh, it's also uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, right? and so this is very uh, timely, you know, given um, all the things that's happening uh, domestically and internationally. And so, uh, for me, it, the journey of really fighting and and creating and finding my mental freedom uh, has to, you know, go back to uh, my investment. And, and tap into my chi. Right? Mm -hmm. The chi that I'm talking about is not only the breath that is sustaining my life and everybody else's life. Uh, so I always share that, you know, if we don't have anything in common, right, we have that breath in common with each other, right? Because that's uh, what connects all of us. Um, but being able to breathe uh, is one thing, but really to be able to tap into the chi. Uh, that allow us to humanize each other and will not do harm to each other uh, is culture, history, and identity, right? So the CHI. 
And so as my, and as someone, you know, who entered the criminal legal system at the age of 16, um, I, I wasn't tapping into my chi. Right? I had low self-esteem, low self-confidence uh, because I didn't have an education and I was lost as a kid, right? The sense of belonging is part of that uh, connection to mental freedom, right? So I was lost uh, as I harmed pe people, right? I, I did not humanize them. I did not really uh, understood their suffering, right? That, that my action uh, creates a, a long lasting trauma impact on my direct victims and the people that who uh, connected with me. And so once I was in the system, um, it was definitely not, not a place uh, to have uh, mental health support or have any type of uh, resources to support uh, my growth and my uh, you know, healing uh, process. So I had to really learn how to survive uh, within the prison industry complex, uh, mm -hmm. to care of myself physically first, right? and then trying to figure out like, what, <coughs> how do I have the opportunity to be able to understand uh, and reflect on the trauma that I inflicted in that way. Mm -hmm. And so part of the journey is to really um, learning how to read and write and find ways to educate myself. Right? So through that process, I was able to um, engage in, in this uh, learning uh, uh, journey. And the learning journey uh, is not only me learning about other people and other things, it's also a, other people learning about me and my journey, right? So this type of collective learning allowed me to engage on this path of collective healing. And part of the collective healing is to, I had to learn how to take responsibility for my action and understanding uh, why I created that harm and, and then what uh, is my purpose right, in life. And so through that process, I was able to really uh, invest in this critical thinking education where I was able to understand my culture and history that informs my identity. And then I was able to learn about other people's culture and history that inform their identities. And so that's how I was able to tap into that chi that eventually led me to that mental freedom that I really needed, that eventually uh, led to my physical freedom for life. And so that's uh, the journey that I always trying to uplift is that in order for us to be able to achieve that mental freedom, uh, we must invest in that chi, right? Being appreciative of our breath and then being appreciative of each other's uh, culture, history, and identity. Right, so it seems like chi ties into your self-love, knowing your history, um, having accountability, and that also fuels your relationship with others that also helps with the healing process. So it really starts with your own breath and, and with your own rhythm is what I'm picking up yes. from you. And that's why I always uh, share, Amina, is that you know we must be willing to engage in a personal revolution before embarking on a collective liberation. And so that the personal revolution is very uh, painful right? because it allow us to uh, to really think deep, right, and be true to ourselves, right, in that process. And that could take a, a long time, right, in that process. Yeah. Uh, so that vulnerability, that clarity, and to be able to uh, dig deep within ourselves and really trace back to uh, our roots, understand the cause of our harm, and connecting uh, to, to that root cause is very key to be able to move forward in the, this process of uh, rehabilitation, process of transformation. And then uh, when, when, when I was able to tap into that chi and to be able to find that purpose, right, uh, in, in life, allow me to be able to um, really stand on the value of racial solidarity as I show up in any spaces, right, in the free world. And so that was, that is the process of creating personal and public safety right in, in that and so people just doesn't make that connection right so for me it's like i'm trying to do what i can to continue to grow into this process because 
the learning is a life learn, a lifelong journey. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. I, you know, I, I'm a member of the Nation of Islam, and one of our teachings is that we learn our history is a knowledge of self. And through that knowledge of self, you know, we're taught that, you know, we are a family, people of all backgrounds, you know, of all class, we are a family, but it starts with your knowledge of self. And that's, I see that in your philosophy of, of chi, that's so beautiful. Um, with New Breath Foundation, you support a lot of grassroots groups in Oakland. So this campaign talks about public safety and from your point of view and your support through funding, what is needed right now to create more safety in Oakland since this is one of the main topics right now? Since we're talking about relationships, right? We're talking about collaboration and, and coming together. And so I know you are definitely contributing to what's going on and, and helping, you know, a lot of organizations in Oakland in, in creating this safety. You know, what, what, what do we need? Well, it's, it's, part of it is that I, when I migrated uh, from mainland China as a kid, you know, I settled in Oakland, California, right? And so part of the, the rich culture of Oakland, right, how uh, has, you know, transition and, and, and transform, you know, over the decades, um, the personal safety and public safety is always at the forefront of everybody, you know, at once. And unfortunately, as part of the way, you know, how uh, systemic racism and structure uh, racism uh, perpetuated a lot of this harm uh, in this process. Um, public safety and personal safety has become more like an individualized versus uh, it's, it's a, a connection to uh, the system, right? And so for me, uh, right now, I mean, there's many forms of the way that we look at how we can create a personal and public safety. But I think one of the main thing that we are neglecting all the time is the trauma, right? Mm. The intergenerational trauma that is perpetuated to historical, mm. um, you know, racism, historical discrimination, right. right? We we forget that sometimes, right? We, because we only respond to um, the immediate harm that people are experiencing and the suffering that people are experiencing, but not. Uh, really understanding the connection to that harm, right? And so for me, uh, in order for us to, you know, one of the strategies really engaging uh, to creating a permanent and long-term uh, mm -hmm. public safety and personal safety is really addressing and validating uh, the, the root causes of the harm, right? And so when we're able to, at least the baseline is that we have to identify uh, you know, what causes you know, these safe communities? What causes uh, people wanting to hurt other people, right? And who are the people that has the access, right? And or has the authority and has the power to be able to uh, heal or, and to address uh, those in a very holistic and authentic uh, kind of uh, uh, solutions that we need to like invest it in a community, right? And so for me, is uh, how are, how do we uh, allocate resources to address that harm and to prevent that harm, right? And so that requires uh, bold leadership, you know, uh, from a city government, right? And then for also from the community-based organizations, and then also people that who are impacted by uh, violence, impacted uh, by those harm to all take responsibility and co-creating solutions, right? To be able to address uh, this challenge uh, we're experiencing, you know, uh, the, the, the issue around violence, you know, is not something new, right? It's, it's really, um, it, it's, the, it's the foundation of the founding of this country, right? Yeah. And so when we talk about violence, um, you know, we know violence well uh, as a country. Yes, and speaking of violence, let's talk about different forms of violence, right? You, New Breath Foundation 
invest in culturally relevant, you know, healing intervention, you know, for communities impacted by deportation, um, by incarceration, violence in the U.S. What resources do we need for individuals, you know, that were formerly incarcerated, that were experiencing deportation to feel like they can be integrated into society and be well and actually thrive? Well, it, it's, it's on multiple levels, right? One is that one of the biggest challenge uh, around, uh, one of the biggest challenges around um, the, the issue of uh, mass incarceration and deportation and then the impact of violence is the, this invisibility, right? Mm -hmm. So when the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Island community are being uh, looked at or being viewed as model minorities, mm -hmm. then uh, from mainstream society all the way from, you know, the, the community to uh, the policy level in the federal government, uh, then we don't get the necessary resources to address some of the challenges within our community because this false narrative that uh, we are better than other people and that we don't have the challenges like other uh, black uh, indigenous and, you know, Latinx and uh, other, uh, you know, communities, right? Mm. Base. And so uh, from that level, we, we really have to look at uh, part of the, the ways that when we talk about challenges, how do we look at incarceration, deportation and violence uh, is connecting to uh, this larger uh, systemic, uh, you know, um, extractive like, uh, like economy, mm. right? It's like, it, it's more it's connecting part of this, uh, uh, the, 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 the slave uh, economy, right, that helped build this country, you know, by the enslavement of the African American community. Mm -hmm. And so I, I say that because historically, when we're looking at how uh, many uh, different ethnic groups within the HPI community, how they're being utilized on a historical level, and then for labor, right, for different uh, forms of labor that helped build this country, but yet not being acknowledged their contribution, uh, to uh, this country and to society in this way. And then for the ANHPI community that who uh, impacted, you know, by mass incarceration, deportation, violence, uh, not only do the mainstream community or the, or, the, or the system does not recognize that, but our own community do not embrace that and recognize that because it's part of the cultural shame, right? Mm -hmm. As part of the cultural shame, you know, that connection to the mental health, nobody's uh, is taboo, right? When it's taboo, so nobody's talking about domestic violence that's happening. Nobody's talking about the gender-based violence that's happening with the ANHPI community. And then therefore, uh, we don't get the culturally competent resources that we need to address uh, those challenges and creating uh, uh, solutions that is rooted uh, from the people who are directly uh, impacted, right, to help uh, address uh, this type of challenges and so that's that's uh, that's one one level right the other level is that we're looking at the way that how uh, uh the institution of philanthropy mm -hmm. right in in this equity in distributing resources and so uh, for many years uh, that there's a lack of uh, uh, investment in distributing those type of resources right meaning that uh we get like even to this day right now we get around 20 cents out of a hundred dollars you know, in the philanthropic dollars when they distribute, right? Mm -hmm. 20 cents, right? And so, but then that's, in the, that's on the, all the issues, right, across the board, you know, within the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Island community. But on the issue on mass incarceration and deportation and the connection to the violence, we get pennies out of that 20 cents. And so when we talk about the, the connection to the lack of investment mm -hmm. in our community, and then the connection to personal public safety and connection to addressing the harm and trauma, right, and the intergenerational trauma that the people are experiencing, then we can see the inequity and we can see how um, invisibilized and marginalized uh, many, of the, uh, many of the ANHPI community are. But the black and brown community are not that much better, right? And especially when it comes to gender-based violence, that resource is like literally pennies. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's all part of connecting to um, how people uh, who are, have the wealth, uh, who has uh, 
power to push policies are not really grounded and rooted within the, with the community, right. right? And so part of that for New Breath Foundation, uh, what we have the privilege to do is to have the trust and the relationship that we have with people on the grounds doing that work on the national level. So they allow us to exist because we are led by formerly incarcerated people. We are led by directly impacted individuals that we really trying to change the way how uh, historical uh, philanthropy or traditional philanthropy practices in as they have the good intention of distributing resources to address some of the challenges, but yet that process sometimes can be very traumatic. And so we try to minimize harm, right, in this philanthropic spaces. First of all, I, we were never at the table anyways for people that who, not myself, right? So therefore, I, I had to create a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And when I'm creating a seat at the table, it's really trying to uh, uh, create access to resources, to create access to, for this uh, collective learning process within the people that who's doing the work on the grounds, as well as with philanthropy that who also believe the importance of uh, changing the way that they, they uh, practice uh, the, the, as a philanthropist, as an institution, how do they uh, change the practices that really empowers people and not so much uh, continue to perpetuate this harm, right? Uh, you know, so we, we've really focused on like making grants to crucial resources, support uh, ANHPI communities, uh, you know, with this uh, hope and healing, keeping families together and movement building and to really uh, dismantle the myth and, and the harmful policy that for so long that this is empowered all of us and, and, and allow um, the, the system to be able to pit us in against each other, right? Have this uh, oppression Olympics, right? It's like, oh, you know, if I give you this money, then I can't give, you, give them that money. And then, well, they have this issues, their issues more important than, than your issue, Right. So all, all these things is just really trying to create this scarcity mentality. But at the same time, uh, there are trillions of dollars, right, just sitting there in the, the, the funds, right, for many of the people that who can, uh, who have the good intentions. But, oh, let me let me put part this fund over here to, to address uh, some of the challenges come up in, in perpetuity. But at the same time, uh, the, the little funding that they are actually distributing it's not really addressing the needs and the urgency in our community, like right now. That's right, that's right. And you know, talking about funding, there's been a lot of protests around the country with, in regards of funding a genocide in Palestine. And I'm seeing, you know, cause we're speaking about the model minority myth and how Asians are invisibilized in this generalized stereotype that, you know, we're just all doing great, you know, but there are a lot of Asian organizers out there, activists that are standing against a genocide in, in Palestine because they are the children of refugees. They are, you know, their families have experienced imperialism, the violence of imperialism and colonization. What are your thoughts on that? Do you feel like that can kind of break that stereotype and you know um yeah yeah i mean there's a growing voice in the asian community against you know uh, it's just a solidarity right there's a solidarity with what's going on in in palestine and and sharing our history any any thoughts on that yeah part of the part of this is the uh it's unacceptable that the our government right is funding the genocide, but yet is proclaim itself to be the most humane uh, society, the most democratic society, right? That really rooted in uh, helping, you know, not only our, the citizens and people of our country, but then also uh, uh, internationally, right? Wanting to be this, the voice and the leader of humanity and democracy in, in interna on the international. But then yet in practice, uh, it's, it's the exact opposite, right? And so for me, I have great respect uh, for the people that who are really making sacrifices, right, to fighting for 
permanent ceasefire, right? To fighting for uh, the the divestment, right? To genocide from from all aspects of our, our lives, right? And part of it is rooted in humanity, like for a, any humanity. So when, you know, I mean, I I claimed to be somewhat well read in, in somewhat in, in spaces, and so. Um, the 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 book I read by uh, Victor Frank, right? Um, you know, one of the uh, the movie that I really appreciate and really enjoy, you know, and really touched by is uh, the Schindler's List, right? And so all the all of the, these things, and we're talking about the Holocaust, you know, how atrocious that is, how how inhumane that is, and we don't want those type of history to repeat itself. And when when we know that, and when we are in the when people who experience that don't want that to happen, why do we want to allow the genocide to happen right now mm -hmm. in, in Palestine, right? And, and so you, this, you, that's, there is no double standard. And this is directly connected to how, why we need to uh, step up, right, for humanity. And part of, uh, for many of the, like, I'm not, I'm, uh, I just want to put a disclaimer out there, right? Uh, I'm not an expert. Uh, I am not a refugee that who came from war-torn countries. Uh, but do my reading and do my learning, right? This is part of the collecting collective learning process. Do my learning. Well, you know, next year is going to be the fiftieth year of the fall of Saigon. You know, mm -hmm. the many of the refugees that experience bombing, uh, people are standing up. They're speaking up. They say, "No, this is not. You can't allow this to happen." Right, mm -hmm. and we we why are we keep allowing history to repeat itself? Mm -hmm. And so, again, it's coming back to that the 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 resources or or the understanding of that tapping into that chi is that um, are we perpetuating more harm or intergenerational trauma continuously, and then at the same time wanting to uh, say that we care about people's mental health, we care about uh, uh, people's uh, humanity and uh, we care mm -hmm. about democracy mm -hmm. and and so it's, it's very contradictive right in in the practice and so therefore i think um for all of us uh, in in this place it's about how do we uh, center around uh, humanity and so the respect i have for many of the uh, people that especially young people right that who is really like exercising their voice that who really understanding that they don't want that to happen uh, to them, to their children, to their grandchildren, and then how how are they? Uh, we all have a responsibility to do that, right? To to stand up for what is right, and so I, I just want to uh, share this last thought around uh, this issue is that um, the 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 people that who fought right in nineteen sixty eight that who really like the, the Third World Liberation Front in San Francisco State, that who fought for uh, ethnic studies, uh, women's studies, and global studies, um, and then in, subsequently in 1969, UC Berkeley, uh, all those uh, uh, people who stood up and fought, right, is because they wanted to tap into that chi, to avoid people to create this the, the economy of like who is more deserving than the other people. And that's it's always been the narrative. It's the uh, keep pitting, pitting us against each other. So, um, so we like we. There is no other way. If we uh, if we don't stop this uh, genocide, mm -hmm. then other genocide will continue to happen. That is going to be to another community. Uh, I mean, it's it's bad enough that uh, internationally there's a many of uh, um, you know the U.S. funded uh, the, the coup d'état. And you know it's still happening. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's like it's happening because all the focus is right now on the genocide, but all the other atrocity is also happening. That's right. So we can't just allow the smoke screen just to uh, just take us to one direction while the harm is being perpetuated in another uh, areas. And you know, uh, speaking of the Third World Liberation Front. You know, it just looking at all the students protesting 
and how the police is treating these protesters, it, it reminded me of, of Asian American activism in the Bay Area. Like you said, the um, Third World Liberation Front, the Asian American Political Alliance, the IWK, the Red Guard, you know, the Bay Area, Oakland has such a rich history of Asian youth, you know, standing up and, you know, going against the war. Um, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful history that needs to be shared. And I think education allows us to about, learn about each other's history so we can do this collective liberation together because that was part of our history you know as asian americans we were fighting together you know and so you are pretty pretty much on the forefront for many years in creating solidarity amongst the black the asian american pacific islander native hawaiian chicano community what can we do right now what ways can folks deepen their relationship to their local communities and cultivate racial solidarity yeah, part, part of part of this really, it, it or, you know, it is that learning, right? The the learning aspect of, you know, I I never had that uh, connect. Uh, I I never I never had that understanding growing up, you know, because um, you know I I was in a whole different uh, country, right? And then but coming coming to this country and then to to, to navigate this journey, or you know, from from that migration to the school to prison and deportation pipeline, you know. Um, what really allowed me to understand is to really see many of the ancestors, right? Many of the, the people that who uh, demonstrated, led by example, right? On how important racial solidarity is, how uh, important it is to be able to invest in building a cross-cultural relationship and nurturing that trust uh, is, is important, right? So you you know you and we we, we you and I both uh, are born in the month of May actually we were born on the same day, <laughs> and so uh, Malcolm X and uh, Rudyard Kochiyama right both uh, our ancestors uh, they were born on the same day too. But not only were they born on the same day, somehow they found each other in their lifetime that they were able to align their value and to be able to build this a uh, trustful relationship, right? And so as someone that, you know, as Yuri, I was, I was actually, I just came back from New York yesterday, you know, I was, uh, you know, I missed the opportunity to go to Harlem uh, to visit, you know, where Yuri used, used to live and when this a big mural, but I was very fortunate to be able to meet up with Yuri's uh, a granddaughter uh, to, mm -hmm. to be able to really uh, get a, another perspective on how uh, important uh, history and the, the investment, the, the racial solidarity is. It is right, and so I, I met. I'm, you know, I was reflecting uh, with Yuri's uh, granddaughters. Like I met Yuri when I was in, incarcerated in San Quentin State Prison. Um, so she came to visit with me with, with my, uh, you know, what I what I call call him my guardian angel, Amo Chada, who used who was an undergrad student at the time. And then they have. I was in the solitary confinement at the time when I met Yuri. Because uh, me and two of my friends, did, and uh, you know, we signed a proposal advocating for uh, Asian American studies, ethnic studies, and prisoners' rights, and we we were all put in solitary confinement, right? And so when I met Yuri, by the time I met Yuri, we have been corresponding already, and Yuri has been really like uh, teaching me, you know, the importance of the racial solidarity work and fighting, uh, just really fighting. Uh, for many of the political prisoners, right, uh, with the, the, the black community, the Puerto Rican community, you know, and, and the Native American community, right, in that space. And so uh, through those type of learning and, and connection, um, I was able to really uh, create that space uh, in, inside the prison industry complex, right? And so part of the relationship is the allowing us the opportunity to be able to uh, engage in this uh, collective lib liberation and um, through this process of uh, collective learning. And so whether it's uh, what, what we're doing uh, in the way that how we show up for each other in, in community, it is to be able to um, utilizing our lived experiences, right, to continue to build and learn uh, from the, the people of color community that who live side by side uh, along with us in that space. And so, uh, whether, whether, when, whether when I was incarcerated, I was always engaging uh, the, you know, the other 
uh, brothers that who also incarcerated along with me, right? Even though there's there are prison politics that dictates that who you can hang out with, who you can't hang out with. Uh, there's uh, racial segregation by the by the system itself, right? They're creating uh, racial segregation within um, the, the prison industrial complex to separate us because that's that's this level of fear, right? That when we come together, because we are my majorities and not minorities, okay. right? That that we will be powerful together, but yet because the, they this, this on the systemic level they they know this right mm -hmm. and the fear of losing that power then all this you know we have witnessed that right on a larger scale through the cointel pro you know how they they were able to dismantle uh, the, the black panthers party mm -hmm. right and uh, the, the red guards the i will cream that, that you talked about you know all those is the people that the chinese uh, folks uh, the, the, the a, a asian american folks are learning from african americans who are fighting for self determination right to be able to invest in that learning and to partner uh, with them towards this collective liberation right one is like when we're fighting for our own self determination it's not at the expense of other oppressed uh, ethnic groups but it's that really understanding that uh, we have our shared liberation, it has to be uh, do our shared struggles and, and, and our shared uh, collective learning, right? And so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still in the process of really uh, learning and, and building, mm -hmm. and I have benefited, mm -hmm. I have benefited, you know, for so long mm -hmm. uh, when I became, when I was able to come into uh, my own, you know, uh, on the, on the mental level, um, as a critical thinker, mm -hmm. that I was able to benefit from this racial solidarity investment, right, and nurturing that relationship within the prison system as well as post incarceration uh, out here in, in, in the free world. It's beautiful. I mean, everything that you just shared, we could we could study. And dissect that whole answer and that will give us so much insight thank you for that you know doing this type of work i'll be honest it's not easy you know i also do this work of solidarity and unity and education um, but i have to say you know being an artist has helped me um, on this path on this work and this love over fear campaign recognizes the power of infusing diverse art forms and healing modalities to create safety and peace and well-being and i know you're obviously a very spiritual person as well so what are your faith practices what are some of your spiritual values that guide guide in your work and how has that helped you you know yeah so i when i was uh when i was inside um, I, you know, I, I'm, I try to uh, do my best to embrace the learning. So I was very, at the beginning, I was very like centered around uh, Buddhism, right? And so that's something that I, you know, just as part of my culture, uh, what, I, what I learned as a, a teenager, um, that was the influence and the, the philosophy. And then when I was inside, you know, I was exposed to, to you know, the Christianity, um, Catholicism, you know, uh, the, the, you know, uh, with, with Muslims, uh, and then also uh, with the Native Americans, you know, all the different type of religions. And I'm trying to learn and embrace and, and trying to figure, like, uh, what is it that allow uh, me to be able to uh, become a, a better person, right? How is it that what is the moral compass that I have to, you know, like uh, understand, like what creates that moral compass, right? And so ultimately, I, I, I think I was a little bit too kind of like uh, critical around the issue of uh, institutional religion, right? And so I, I never liked in institution religion because ultimately it led me back to that we must uh, treat each other as human beings, mm -hmm. that we must of each other, right? We, if we, have, we must practice, you know, how to uh, treat others. I want to be treated within that context of uh, love uh, and humanity, you know. And so, uh, so from there, 
you know, my spirituality is really rooted in my connection and my relationship that I have with people, right? And so, as you see, uh, you know, many of these books and some of them, you know, I, I even brought it out uh, from from the prison and some of them uh, people sent me, some of them, uh, you know, so all of these is part of my spirituality. And so th they guide me, this, these type of books uh, guide me to how to become a better person, how to minimize harm. And, and so at, at the same time, you know, there's other practices I will really like, you know, one of the, that's why I always uh, greet people with happy new breath, because it was that the breath that allows me to have hope, right? It's, it's investing in that breath and, and the, the deep appreciation about um, the, not, not just the breath that we inhale and take for granted all the time, right? As, as we, we are speaking and, and talking and sharing this space, you know, we're breathing, but we don't pay too much attention to that because we expect the next breath to come. Mm -hmm. And so when I was inside, the idea of not even having the opportunity to be free, you know, not having a, a hope is something that uh, could be demoralizing in, in for many people, right? And it does, you know, for people that who, couldn't, who didn't make it out to the free world. And so breathing uh, was one of the very, uh, uh, you know, a key things that allow me to uh, create new beginnings, to have hope, right? And so, uh, so I used to do meditation, I to do yoga, Pilates, you know, staying fit physically, right? Exercising, and then I picked up Tai Chi a few years ago. Uh, it's really practicing Tai Chi to connect uh, to, you know, all all, the, all these uh, spiritual. Uh, leaders right here right and so um but i i and i do have to confess that i not investing enough time uh, to continue to be well read and to be able to uh, have more time set aside to do this right instead of only focusing on externally because um the urgency is always there and so part of that you know just kind of shifting uh, 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 some of them to go back to what, what you uh, mentioned earlier is that as we are navigating this type of work, but it's also about the internal work, right? That we have to invest in that um, we can't do it all. You know, we, uh, we don't, it's not that we want people to be a martyrs, right? Uh, we don't want people to be saying that, oh, if I don't do this, then I should think less of myself because I'm not doing what so-and-so is doing, what all these other people are doing and what other people are sacrificing, right? We all have a different roles to play at different times of our life, right? Because it's a process. You know, when I was 16, my mindset is totally different than where I'm at right now, right? And so therefore we have to embrace that, right? And we have to create spaces for people to grow into uh, this this way of uh, the, the mindfulness right, and, and critical thinking, and so uh, for people that who uh, embrace you know religion right as as a part of the spirituality and moral compass, yes, you know investing that right and lead by example right and demonstrate to people that this is what uh, guides me and this is what what gives me. Uh, the drive and the hope and the love that I need to be able to show up, you know, do that. Um, yeah, so. Right, that's right. Um, you know, what you share can remind me of similar method. I love reading. I'm always constantly studying. And what I read, what I study, it's like what we, f you know, fuel our mind and feed our mind. And then we go and process it through our bodies. You know, I think with your Tai Chi and you know, with yoga, it's it's the knowledge and then getting it into your, your body. And for me, that is whatever I'm reading, I also put it in my art. And it's my, my watercolor paintings. It's, it's my paintings as a form of meditation for me, just like yoga, you know. So I, I process what I learn into physical through my art form. I think that's the root of what I call art activism. So, um, yes. yeah. So 
you do like amazing art and you do beautiful art that really you know uh, is your channeling right that that's a that's a channeling that you do you know that allows you not only uh, have a, a place for healing to your art but you're healing other people right? i think that that's what 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 is uh, amazing about it it's like you know do this process that you put in to your art you know you you're healing yourself and you're healing other people at the same time thank you thank you i appreciate that thank you so much and i, I just want to add this like, i mean is that uh, uh from the time that i i have known you and you know how we uh, continue to build and, and nurture uh this relationship is that you know your faith and, and your presence uh, in islam uh in 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 within the, that community you demonstrate you already demonstrate you know what it takes as part of it to be able to create those type of, of racial solidarity and, and a personal and public safety that we need right and not only that and you are utilizing that platform to be able to uh, engage other people uh, uh, you know that who are formerly incarcerated who are directly impacted and so uh, and you're bringing connections together, right? You're making that connection uh, on on issues, you know, on the on the humanity, right? And, and the centering that I think that uh, that is a very, uh, uh, you know, like you you actually to, you practicing um, the answer. I mean, the question that you asked me earlier, right? How do we create, uh, you know, this? Like, what what do what can we do? you know, right now, right, to invest in so we can create a better society together right, in this space. I receive that message deeply. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. And as folks know, they would say, you know, glory to God. And, you know, in Islam, we say all praise is due to Allah. And it's um, guided um, by my heart and my love for for peace. That's what Islam means. It means, it means peace. Um, I, you know, I always ask this to every one of my guests. Um, if we did a public presentation and we take off the veil of love, we take, take off the veil, we, we do this big revealing, what does love look like right now at this very present moment with all the issues that are going on? What does it look like? What does it need in your mind? What does that, that vision look like? You know what, uh, I, I'm being reminded you know, like at least twice a week, I'm, I'm being reminded what love is, right? I mean, it, love shows up ma in many ways. Um, so when I hear, when I'm at home, right? And when I hear uh, this, this, this question, right? That is popping out, say, whose time is it to shine? It's like, Who, whose time is it to shine? And when I heard that, Every time I hear that, a smile come out of my face because that is my daughter finishing washing her hair, and it's time for me to go both blow dry her hair. <laughs> so that's my time to shine, right? So every time she says that, so she's upstairs and I'm down here, and like, who time is to shine? I'm like, me, 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 and I would drop whatever I'm doing to rush up there, right? So I can shine. That's love to me. That that is a that's love we all, mm -hmm. all have a, a time and space to shine right. we are capable of that love that's right that's right oh that touched me right there right there just i'm gonna use that tell her i'm gonna borrow <laughs> that <laughs> what time what i don't know how long that's going to last to shine. she's getting you know older and older i'm like yeah. i'm gonna shine as much as i can because uh you know, next thing you know, it's like, yeah, I have to find a, another reminder. <laughs> right, right, right. And folks, you know, we're, we're getting to the last, you know, a few minutes of um, our podcast. If you have any questions for Eddie, this is the time to put in the comment section. Uh, but I, I love that answer. It is your time to shine, which to me means truly accepting yourself, being yourself, right? Including accountability including educating yourself, educating yourself about others, learning about your own history so you can appreciate 
others history so we can do this this work together in, in collective liberation and eddie you've been again like i mentioned you've been an inspiration to me and so many um others thank you so much for all the work that you've done um and yes our birthday is coming up it's may 29th my fellow gemini my birthday twin what are you doing for your birthday we have to use this time to shine it's our birthday <laughs> uh i'm gonna be at a place there's sunshine yeah. you know blue sky and I'm just gonna try to find that uh, center. I right? trying to disconnect a little bit uh, because you know well, uh, the mental health is not uh, which day and which month, right? Mental health is uh, so key to everybody's liberation, right? And so for people who are at the front line, you know, protesting, uh, fighting to breathe, fighting uh, for their lives, fighting for freedom, you know that. They also need that space and time to be uh, have to find that little uh, peace, right? So they can rejuvenate, you know. Uh, because it's, it's, yes, the urgency is now. People are dying now, and yet uh, to for us to continue, right, to fight uh, with with that north star in mind, you know, we have to really take care of our physical self and then our. our a mental self, right? That's right. And so, always remember to take some deep breaths, right? And no matter how tough it is, you know, sometimes it's unbearable. Um, but w when when we're able to breathe, then then that that's a new beginning. That's an opportunity to continue fighting. Each breath is a new beginning. It's an honor, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you for being on our podcast. And I hope, um, you know, I see some Gemini love in the conversation. Happy birthday and shout out to all the Geminis out there. It's time to shine, everyone. And yes, celebrate life. Thank you, Eddie. Have a beautiful and safe, blessed day. And everyone, you too, we'll see you on the next podcast, Unveiling Love, Stories of Community and Social Change. Thank you, Eddie. Peace and blessings. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I'm encouraged by all of your presence. Yes, yes, yes. See everyone. Salam alaikum.